Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome New York Times columnist Jim Dwyer and panelists Hakeem Jeffries and Mark Kleiman. Good afternoon. Congressman, you are a member of a bipartisan 12-person group formed recently in the wake of all these terrible events. Is this yet more eyewash to make it seem like both parties or either party is doing something that they really don't care about? Certainly hope not. And I think that the formation of this bipartisan working group uh, came about as a result of members of both parties in the House concluding in the aftermath of what took place in Baton Rouge and then in Minnesota and then in Dallas that this time needed to be different. And in order for it to be different, the approach that was taken by Congress should be different. And so instead of simply just having a hearing before the Judiciary Committee calling in a few witnesses taking testimony for a few hours uh, and then retreating into our ideological corners, that a working group would give us the opportunity to appoint Paul Ryan on the one hand, chairman of the Congressional Black Caucus on the other, six serious members from both parties who have a history of dealing with these tough issues to spend the recess speaking to people on all sides of the debate and then trying to really come back, find common ground, and introduce uh, something legislatively that can show America that on this problem, the House Congress is attempting to get something done to move us beyond this cycle that we've been through. Well, you have a horrific incident of police brutality, police violence, excessive use of force, whatever one may want to call it. It's captured on video. Many people throughout the nation are horrified their marches, their rallies, their call for action to take place. Often a grand jury is convened. Often no indictment is returned. Sometimes the Department of Justice decides to investigate. Oftentimes they don't. Usually whatever investigative body looks at this, there's no accountability. And then the cycle continues from the perspective of a lot of people in this country. And so uh, I'm hopeful and cautiously optimistic that there are 12 serious members and that all of us are committed to trying to actually get something done that can improve the situation. Well, Professor, it sounds like he's talking about getting through another cycle of the politics of the last atrocity, right? That's what we're responding to, but maybe they'll do something different. But you take a longer view of it, and I know that um, uh, you've studied some things like CompStat, and CompStat, for those who don't know it, is a system initiated in New York about 20 years ago that involved drilling down into very localized crime patterns. But isn't this at odds with our hopes for community policing, for sending cops scurrying after every little quality of life violation in New York? What's your finding on this? Well, What's your experience with it? So you mentioned CompStat. Yeah. Um, so last Thursday, I actually went to the NYPD Comstat meeting. <clears throat> this is a meeting with 100 top people from the department and the entire command crew from a precinct, um, or a group of precincts, at which they're talking about recent crime patterns, particularly shootings, <clears throat> what was done in each case, what could be done to prevent the next case, and they were relentless with each other if, if a ball had been dropped. Um, and it occurred to me about 15 minutes into it that I was at a Black Lives Matter demonstration. It wasn't billed that way, but this was 100 people spending four hours in the morning trying to figure out how to save the lives of entirely, as far as I can tell, African American and Latino shooting victims. <clears throat> and so what worries me about first worrying about incidents of police brutality, um, and then worry, worrying about uh, violence against the police, um, is that we're going to ask the question, how can we improve, improve police community relations? It's a crucial question. 
How can we make policing more lawful? It's a crucial question. And drop the question of how we can make it more effective. Over the last 25 years, the homicide rate in the United States has fallen by half. That is a spectacular social accomplishment that we ought to be celebrating. And that's certainly not all of the work of police departments, but some of it is. And so one thing that bothers me now is that we're asking departments to focus on good relations with the community and not reminding them to focus on the most important thing, which is keeping people from getting killed. Well, is that why this homicide drop has been so unevenly dis distributed, that you have cities like Chicago where there's just uh, an awful plague of shootings all the time, and you have New York, which has become uh, the peaceable kingdom in so many ways? What, what's happening that you can get these disparities among the cities? Why aren't they copying each other? Oh, well, partly they're not demographically comparable, uh -huh. right? The change in the population base in New York, it's being discussed earlier, certainly has something to do with this. Some extent, New York City has outsourced its homicides to Newburgh. Uh -huh. um, so you don't, you don't blame the Chicago Police Department entirely. Right. But on the other hand, NYPD has a long history of competence and a recent history, uh, since at least 1992, of very aggressive competence focused entirely on reducing serious crime. I mean, the, the notion of reducing, of controlling quality of life crimes, the, the background notion of that was always, this was gonna get us to reducing violence. Now, whether that's true or not, I think is, remains an open research question. Right. Um, but there's no doubt that the, the, the ComStat process the process of focusing the entire department on serious crime and what to do about it can be successful. And yeah, I think places like Chicago need to be encouraged, again, to fix both halves of their problem. Chicago Police Department tolerates more misbehavior among its officers than the New York Police Department does. And it also does a much less good job of controlling crime because, of course, if you make yourself the enemy of the community, you're not going to get any information. I mean, the, the central insight of community policing was not about quality of life. It was understanding that controlling violence is a cooperative effort of the neighbors and the police, that you can't do it as an occupying army. That, that lesson is still being learned. The occupying army issue is, and the metaphor is a very important one. Uh, Congressman, we heard, uh, uh, I think, uh, one of the... Uh, uh, congressman from uh, Iowa, I believe, state that black lives matter. We were in a war and black lives matter was the enemy. And in your bipartisan group, are you dealing with some of those attitudes? Well, at least in terms of the, the bipartisan group, everyone has an open mind and I think is convinced that this has to be an evidence-based exploration, which means that we're going to have to on all sides, speak to people who uh, may otherwise make us uncomfortable. And so I think we've all agreed, for instance, that we need to speak to people affiliated with the Black Lives Matter movement who are raising a very important issue uh, for the nation to confront. We also need to speak to law enforcement folks at the high level uh, in terms of leadership, but also the rank and file police officers who are on the ground protecting and serving each and every day uh, in an increasingly hostile environment. If I could also add, I think that the issue of policing is, is complex because you have the sort of flashpoint incidents that occur that get the nation's attention. But there are a whole host of day-to-day -day things that we need to address. We're asking the police in many ways to enforce what a lot of folks in Congress and across the country from the left and from the right have viewed as an unjust system of over-criminalization of America. We've got this mass incarceration problem, 2.2 million people incarcerated, notwithstanding the declining crime rates that the professor earlier spoke about. With half the people who are behind bars in this country, nonviolent drug offenders who do not pose a threat to anyone. And then when you layer on top of that, the sort of, whether you call it broken windows, stop and frisk, taxation by citation that we saw in Ferguson, that we're asking the police day-to-day -day officers to sort of enforce an approach uh, 
uh, certain communities in this way that creates a climate of hostility and tension. Uh, all of those issues are things that we're going to have to take a look at if we're going to meaningfully solve this problem. I would also suggest in terms of the New York example and the decline in crime that Comstat has been incredibly important. There's been some visionary leadership uh, from Police Commissioner Bratton, you know, 1.0 and then of course 2.0 the second time, but 1.0 uh, in particular. Crime was also dropping under Ray Kelly 1.0. Uh, in his last two years as police commissioner for the Dinkins administration. I don't think we give them uh, enough credit, uh, and we should. Absolutely right. But uh, notwithstanding the changing dynamics in terms of gentrification, and I represent a district that in certain parts is incredibly gentrifying in Fort Greene and Clinton Hill, Bedford stuyvesant other parts, Ocean Hill, Brownsville, and uh, East New York looks exactly the same demographically, yet in those two police precincts, the 73rd precinct in Brownsville and the 75th precinct in East New York, relative to the city, crime is still uh, significantly higher, but relative to the crack cocaine era in the 1980s or the early 1990s, it's dropped dramatically, even though demographically it looks exactly the same. And so I think there's credit that goes to a lot of uh, people, both yeah. within the police force as well as the community partners. Yeah, yeah it's moved along quite a way in the last 25 years. We're going to, uh, in about five or six minutes, we're going to take some questions. And please feel free to email them if you like, or there'll be a microphone out in the audience. The email uh, pops up from time to time. It's, I think, q at nytimes.com. But check, check my math. Uh, one of the uh, chiefs um, who spoke out after the God knows which shooting it was. Was it the one in Minnesota? He said, we're asking 25-year-olds to take on the weight of a poor educational system, uh, lack of job opportunity, poor housing, a whole host of uh, ills, including isolation by lack of transportation and so forth. All of these things get turned over to the one face that the government puts on the street, and that's a cop. And it's often a young, young person, particularly a young man. Are, are we making a mistake here, or are those the right people to have on the front line? I think we could do better with an older department. The FBI won't look at a recruit under the age of 25. Mm -hmm. I should note for those who are concerned about urban budgets, <clears throat> that hiring people at 25 rather than 20 would save a lot on the pensions at the other end. <laughs> um, uh, but it also gets some of the testosterone down. Yeah. Uh, of course, there's another test te technique for changing the test testosterone ratio. Um, what evidence, would that be? Uh, <laughs> there's, there's evidence that women uh, uh, get involved in fewer violent incidents as police officers. Yeah. Um, but the key thing, I don't really believe in gender discrimination in hiring, but you got to look at the data. Um, but the key thing is to stop recruiting and training as if we were building an infantry platoon. You look at a police academy, it's basically modeled after infantry basic training. Not exactly what we're trying to train for. You've got to think about what you want those people to do and train them for that. Well, who's doing it right? Um, I don't know of anybody in the US that's appropriately reformed Police training. I think it's well. How do we know more. what? Well, how do we know what appropriate reform is if nobody's doing it right? I don't think we know. Uh -huh. I think we can look and say, if you spend a lot of time in training, training officers for situations where they might get shot, you might make them trigger happy. Right. If you recruit them chiefly for their athletic prowess, you might not get the personality profile you might want of somebody who can de-escalate de a situation. My favorite piece of folk anthropology, I've never wanted to check on this fact because it might, not, might turn out not to be true. We say in the newspapers, <coughs> never check out a good story. Exactly. So the story is that the first course in Japanese police academy is Zen flower arranging. Uh -huh. I actually do think that if I were going to train somebody to go on the streets of New York, I'd want to do a lot of mindfulness training first. Um, what would that be like? You'd have to ask somebody who does that for a living. Okay. 
Um, but basically, teach people not to respond to affronts as male primate dominance challenge. Right. Right? I mean, it, it, it's not that this is entirely uncharted territory. People know a lot about what causes and avoids violence. Yeah. We need to spend some more time. In, and, and by the way, training does not end at the, the academy. Right? Somebody graduates from the police academy, goes on the street under a training officer, who's a 15-year veteran of the department, who says, OK, now, forget everything you learned in the academy. I'm going to tell you how it's really done. Right. So we have to make sure that the training officers aren't undoing the good work that the academy did. Congressman, uh, your group, your task force group, um, is that being led by Paul Ryan, or who, who's, run, who's sort of chairing it? Yeah, it's been uh, chaired on the Republican side by Bob Goodlatte, who's the chair of the Judiciary Committee, a Republican from Virginia, and by John Conyers on the Republican side, Democratic side, who's the um, dean of the House of Representatives. Uh, you know, in fact, John Conyers, I think, is the only man alive uh, who, who's been endorsed both by Barack Obama and the Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. Uh, so quite, quite an accomplishment. He's been in the Congress for 50 years, entered as a young civil rights uh, lawyer and activist. So he's leading the charge on the Democratic side. And, but it was Paul Ryan who a few of us approached initially with the idea that we need to kind of work on this problem in a meaningful way. Uh, this is complicated, and you know the problem of sort of the police use of excessive force in limited instances, the overwhelming majority of police officers certainly are in the community to protect and serve, and in my capacity as a member of Congress, work closely with them. Uh, but we also can't ignore the historic reality of the situation that uh, dates back decades, uh, and several of us were reflecting on the fact that it wasn't the Rodney King uh, incident that was really the first time that America was able to see what a lot of African Americans had been talking about in terms of some of the tense interactions. It was actually videos captured uh, by television crews in the early to mid 1960s where you had Bull Connor in uh, Birmingham, Alabama, or Sheriff Jim Clark and the Alabama State Troopers on the Edmund Pettus Bridge. But law enforcement, particularly in the Deep South historically, were used inappropriately to enforce the code of Jim Crow. And so there's a deep-seated relationship, often filled with tension, that dates back a long time that we have to work through. And we shouldn't have to put that burden on the young officers, 20 or 21-year-olds who are on the streets of America right now. And that's why I think it's going to take a, a real adult exploration of all of the factors that relate to the complex relationship if we're going to you know, be able to meaningfully work through this problem. The shocking thing about that shooting in Chicago was not that somebody you know, in the moment panicked and did the wrong thing. It was that 16 other members of the Chicago Police Department wrote up false reports about what had happened. And we only learned that because there was video. Uh, Mark Moore, who's my teacher in this, made a point many years ago that I've, I haven't seen people talk about enough. There's one kind of police misconduct that all cops agree in hating. All and cops what? Agree in hating. Yeah. Don't tolerate. And that's corruption. Yeah. So when Bill Bratton was first commissioner here, uh, you know, New York City still had a, a, a continuing corruption problem. Um, one of the things that Bratton did was he would go to the roll call and personally take the gun and badge of an officer who's being fired for corruption. Yeah. And everybody understood that corruption was something that was a disrespect to the uniform and a damage to the institution. Right. And they didn't want that guy on their force. So Mark Moore's point is corruption is the abuse of public office for private gain. If you get people to understand that excessive use of force is a kind of corrupt practice Right. And get police to be as intolerant of, of brutality, yeah. of false testimony, as they are of corruption, you would have solved the cultural problem. Thank you. Now, can we get some questions? Let me go to one that came over on Facebook, um, or I'm sorry, over email. Um, 
this question was, President Obama recently said that we need to build a culture where respecting the tremendous sacrifice of police officers doesn't have to be mutually exclusive from questioning the quality of policing and holding misbehavior accountable, which I think ties exactly with what we were just talking about. How do we begin doing this, especially in New York, especially when we see disagreements over two people watching the same video and uh, a disagreement over whether it is an excessive use of force? You're talking about the Garner case. I'm talking about the Garner case. And, and Congressman, I'd, I'd love to hear your thoughts. Well, I, I do think, first of all, that body cameras are a step in the right direction in terms of potentially providing for greater visibility into what happens in a police encounter on the street, both from the perspective of law enforcement and from the perspective of the civilian and those who may subsequently uh, watch the encounter if it goes wrong. Uh, it, it will not always lead to a successful prosecution, although sometimes it may take different, different levels of government uh, to bring a successful prosecution if reasonable people can conclude that a crime was committed. That was the case uh, in Los Angeles with Rodney King, the original four officers were tried at the state court. They were all acquitted. Of course, led to an eruption in Los Angeles. They were subsequently tried. Two of them were convicted by the Department of Justice Civil Rights Division. And we may actually see that happen uh, in the Garner situation. The more interesting thing to me about police cameras or body cameras as a starting point was when I had a conversation with the commanding officer from the 75th Precinct uh, if my recollection is correct, and I asked him about this pilot program uh, where some of his officers were voluntarily being asked to wear body cameras and what their reaction was to it. He suggested to me that initially there was reluctance, but that over time they came to embrace it uh, for two reasons. One, uh, oftentimes if a civilian may be misrepresenting the nature of the encounter, the body camera can clarify, but perhaps more importantly, that because they are required when they're wearing body cameras, at least in New York, to, to inform the citizen on the street that they are doing so, that the officers found that in many instances that de-escalated the level of hostility and the conflict and calmed things down uh, in a way that worked out for both the citizen and for the officer. And so I think we've got to find common ground first and then go on to tackle the more difficult aspects of police accountability and breaking the blue wall of silence and the police tolerance in too many instances uh, for these things that occur, or at least looking the other way, is going to be part of it as well. Well, we're less than 10 years into the iPhone era, believe it or not, right? A decade ago, we didn't have these things. We didn't have cell phones, I mean, videos, cameras in every pocket of every citizen and creating kind of a free range history. But they have become uh, uh, a tool of provo provocation at times, it seems to me. There's a, there's a tension on the street uh, when people will put a video in a camera or a, a phone in a, in a cop's face while he's trying to deal with a situation. And uh, have you heard from the police about that, Professor? Uh, I'm not close enough to it. I mean, yeah. I mean it's, it's clear that police have to be trained that if they're in a public place, they can be videoed. Right. And they're not entitled to arrest somebody for running a video camera. On the other hand, obviously, you shouldn't be in somebody's face. Right. Um, None of us the, like having a, a camera right. stuck in our face the, involuntarily. The flip of that, by the way, is that we now have every citizen walking down the street with a video camera. No police department that I'm aware of has created the software interface that would allow somebody who sees a criminal activity or a bad situation to touch an app and transmit that video to the police department to do something about it, right? We're still in, we're still in the very primitive 911 era. All right. Uh, that seems to me important work to do that could both help reduce crime and make the citizens feel that the cops were doing something for them. Because remember, the congressmen say this better, better than I can, but if you go to a high crime neighborhood, you get two complaints. One is the cops are brutal and rude, and the other is, they don't do enough to control crime. And we have to figure, figure out how to control, answer both of those complaints, not one at a time. Well, I really enjoyed this conversation. I really appreciate both of you gentlemen coming. And thanks a lot. Thank you. Good work. Great job. And we'll